Good morning. Uh, welcome again to our service here at Pinecrest Church. Once again, we're using a different means than normal and having our service online during this time of the spread of the coronavirus. But we thank you for tuning in and joining us uh, online today and are thankful for the Lord in providing this technological means for us to do so. I want to once again thank Kathy Carson and Christian and Callie for being here with me today so that we can broadcast our service in this way. I do want to just bring you up to date briefly and let you know that the Pinecrest session has voted to suspend all services and activities uh, at the church during this time at the recommendation of our state and national governments. Uh, we will continue to broadcast online until we are able to meet again. Uh, we do want to remain connected, so please uh, follow us on Facebook and online. Uh, also, communicate with us if you have any needs or concerns or prayer requests. Another unique thing that we have done this week is we've put together several care packages, and so if you are interested or need some assistance and aren't able to get to the grocery store uh, at this time, please contact the church, and we'll be happy to drop you off uh, a few of those basic needs. And then also, if you know of someone that's quarantined or unable uh, to go to the store because they are high risk, let us know, and we'll be happy to drop off a basket at their door as well. As we uh, come before the Lord at this time, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are with us, that you, Lord, reign, that you, Lord, are at work even today in this world. Help us, Lord, to turn to you. Help us, Lord, to trust in you. Help us, Lord, to give you thanks and to give you praise for who you are, all that you have done and all that you are continuing to do and all that you have promised to do for us. We pray this prayer in the name of our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Callie. Thank you, Christian. As we continue our time together, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, please continue to keep our church and its members in prayers, but we also want to especially lift up our nation and the world as well, especially during this time of outbreak. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that on this day, in the midst of the storms of this world, in the midst of chaos, uh, Father, in our own lives, we know the one who is in charge of the storms, the winds, and the waves. It is you, our great God, and it is you we turn to at this time. It is you that we focus our eyes upon. It is you, Lord, that we trust in, and we pray, Father, for your grace and for your mercy. We pray for reminders of your promises and of your presence with us, and help us, Lord, to look and to stand and trust upon you. Father, we lift up this world today. Now, Father, we just couldn't even imagine just a few weeks ago uh, to see a disease that would spread throughout the world so quickly and have our effects uh, that we are experiencing, Lord, right in our neighborhoods. Come, Lord, and be with us, we pray. Protect those that are sick. Heal them, Lord, and we pray, Father, for those that take care of them, family and doctors and nurses, for your hand of protection to be upon them. We pray, Lord, also that you would be at work in the scientists and doctors that are working on cures. Our hearts uh, delight to know, Lord, that there has been some progress in this department, and we pray, Lord, that you would continue uh, to guide them, Lord, in providing treatments that will bring an end to this disease and, Lord, uh, bring uh, restoration both to individual lives and to our world and to our livelihoods. We pray, Lord, also for our nation's leaders. Would you, Lord, be with them? Would you, Lord, guide them? Would you, Lord, help them in making decisions that, Father, would help take care of the ones you've entrusted to their care on this very day? May they not just rely upon earthly wisdom, but may they, Lord, look to you and to your guidance and trust in you and do, Father, according to your will and according to your instructions you've given us in your word. We pray, Lord, also for our churches. We pray for the church around the world, many who are being affected by this virus and this outbreak that are having to uh, lead their churches differently, that are having to trust in you, uh, Father, for protection, uh, both physically and uh, financially and spiritually. We pray, Lord, also for our missionaries, as we know of many that are quarantined around the world, unable to go home, and Father, uh, not in the presence of near friends and family. May you watch over, protect, and guard, and protect them. And yes, Lord, we also pray that for our churches here in America, as we many of us have gone online, as many of us are not able to be physically present with us, and Lord, how we miss that fellowship of the church. But Lord, remind us of our connection by the Holy Spirit. Help us to use the means that are available to us to check in with each other, to pray for one another, uh, Lord, and to be there to support one another at this time. We pray, Lord, and above all, that you would help us to trust in you, to look to you, and Father, to be your lights and your salt in this world on this very day. Come, Lord, and be with us. Be with these requests that are affected by this virus. But, Lord, we pray for anything that those uh, that are listening to the service today are dealing with, uh, Father, that you will help remind them that you, Lord, are with them, that you, Lord, will see them through, that, Lord, your promises are just as true today as they were yesterday and as they will be tomorrow. You, Lord, have the whole world in your hands, and you, Lord, have the power and ability, and you have, in fact, promised to work all things together for good. So help us to trust in you. Help us to look for you at work in this situation and to follow you wherever that may lead us, both on this day and every day to come. We lift this to you in the precious and powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. i 
Again, Christian and Callie. As we continue our time together this morning, we want to turn and look to God's Word. During this time of meeting online, I've decided to take a brief break from our Daniel study, and we'll be returning to that as soon as we're back together. And while we're meeting online, I thought I'd continue, as I did last week, to spend some time going to some of my favorite psalms and remind us of what they teach us in God's Word. They teach us God's truth, but also we know the psalms for the great peace and comfort and assurance they bring to us as well. Another favorite psalm of mine is actually the very first psalm we have, Psalm 1. And this is a great psalm because of the teaching it gives us in and of itself But one of the unique things about Psalm 1 and the reason that the psalmist and whoever put them together, I believe, put Psalm 1 at the very start of this book is it actually serves as a gateway psalm that also establishes several truths that we need to know and several things that we need to know and keep in mind as we look through the rest of Psalms. But actually, we will see these things through the rest of wisdom literature, such as also in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, but also it establishes themes that we can see throughout all of God's Word. So we'll be turning to and looking to Psalm 1 together this morning. 
Hear now the reading of God's word. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, your word, and we thank you for this time together this morning that we can spend contemplating your word, feeding upon it, and being guided and nourished by it. Help us, Lord, to come before it and guide us by your Holy Spirit, so, Lord, that we can listen to what you would have us to hear, we can learn what you'd have us to learn, and we could live as you would have us to live for your praise and for your glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. A popular thing online nowadays are memes, and one of the memes that is going around constantly is there are two types of people in the world. There's two types of people, and online you'll see many different answers to those two types of people. They'll say there's two types of people, extroverts and introverts. There's two types of people There's socialists and capitalists. There's two types of people. There's leaders and followers. There's two types of people. There are people who eat the pizza crust and people who do not. There's two types of people. There are people that turn the toilet paper towards the wall and those that turn it away from the wall. There are two types of people. Perhaps my favorite I found online is this one. It says, there are three types of people. There are people who are good at math and those who are not. Might take you a while to get that one. If you need to hit pause for a second and look at the answer and what I meant by that one, do so. All right, welcome back. It's good to have you with us. There's two types of people in the world, and as much as we might see this online, Scripture, and in fact, Psalm 1 tells us that there is actually two types of people in the world today, and they use different categories to describe these two types of people. They speak of the wise people, person and the fool. The wise being the one who chooses what is best, the fool being the one who neglects what is best. They speak in Psalm 1 and throughout the Psalms and wisdom literature of two types of people. There are the righteous and the wicked. The righteous being the one who has right standing with God. The wicked being the one who does not have right standing with God. There are two types of people in Scripture, in Psalm 1, in wisdom literature. There is the wicked, and there is the righteous, which also means there is the cursed, and there is the blessed. The cursed being the one who is under God's disfavor, and the blessed being the one who is under God's favor. There's two types of people, but these can all be combined, all these terms and all these descriptions, into one You can speak of the one who is wise, who is also righteous, who is also blessed, and the one who is a fool, who is also wicked, who is also cursed. And as we turn to Psalm 1, this very first psalm, it combines these three into one, and it uses the analogy of a plant to teach us about these people. You have the tree, which represents the wise the righteous and the blessed, and you have the chaff, which represents the fool who is wicked and is cursed. So let's dive into this analogy as we see it in Psalm 1 and ask ourselves some questions about what makes the difference between a tree and chaff and also get to the question, which one am I? Am I a tree or am I chaff? But perhaps we need to take a pause and just look at that first important question. 
What is chaff? We're all familiar probably with what a tree is, but maybe it's not so quickly in our vocabulary what chaff is. Well, chaff is that seed covering or other debris that separates the seed from the grain. If you're not as familiar with grain, you may be able to think of chaff as the husk on a corn. Or perhaps if you're like me, perhaps the thing that I most come in common with today is the peanut or the pecan, not the hard shell. But when you take that off, do you remember that brittle paper-like covering over the nut that you have to rub away before you eat the nut? That is comparable to what chaff is in Scripture Now, chaff was created by God, and it serves a great purpose in our world today. It does provide additional covering and protection for those vital seeds. But when we turn to wisdom literature, chaff is always treated negatively. It's always treated negatively, and this would go along with the connotations that the Israelite people would have had with chaff in an agricultural society because they would depend upon the harvest and just thinking about how many hours they would have to spend day upon day working to get rid of the chaff so they could have the seeds, they could have the fruit, they could have the food that they needed. They would have likely had negative connotations with the chaff as well. But why does wisdom literature negatively view chaff? Well, we'll see three reasons, both from Psalm 1 and the rest of Scripture today. Chaff is treated negatively in Scripture because chaff is fragile. It is fruitless, and it is fleeting. Chaff is fragile. It is easily destroyed. It falls apart in your fingers. Chaff is so easily destroyed that the Israelites would get rid of the chaff mostly by winnowing. This is the practice of taking the tool, putting it into the mixed together chaff and grain, throwing it up in the air. The seeds that were heavy would fall down to the ground, but the chaff would easily separate and then be caught and blown away in the wind. The chaff was fragile. The chaff was also fruitless. The chaff did not really have life nor give life. It did not have fruit. In fact, chaff has no nutritional value and it is indigestible by humans. It does not have life nor give life. It is fruitless. In fact, you could argue that chaff in some ways is actually parasitic. It is actually dependent upon what has life in order to survive, as it depends upon the fruit and it depends upon the plants. And then finally, chaff is viewed negatively because it is fleeting. It is here but for a moment. Its days are numbered from the very start, and then it is quickly gone. Here a moment, and then gone the next. But unlike chaff, which is viewed negatively in Scripture, the tree, time and time again, is viewed favorably in Scripture. Why is it viewed favorably? Because it has exactly the opposite of the chaff. Instead of being fragile, a tree is rooted. We read in verse 3, he is like a tree planted by streams of water, rooted by streams of water. Think about this for a moment. The same wind that we just talked about that comes and blows on the chaff and destroys it and blows it away, it blows upon the tree and absolutely nothing happens because the tree is sturdy. The tree is rooted. Unlike the chaff, which is fruitless, the tree is fruitful. We read in verse 3, it yields its fruit in its season. The tree not only has life, the tree produces evidence of that life. And in that fruit, that life is beneficial in bringing life to others. It is fruitful, has life, and brings life. And unlike the chaff, it is not fleeting. The tree is long-lasting. We read in verse 3, its leaf does not wither. Unlike the chaff, which is here for a moment and gone the next, the tree lasts for season after season, year after year. 
In California, it's believed that several of the trees there are well over 4,000 years old. Trees are long-lasting. But this tree described in Psalm 1 has superior life than any other tree that we have seen because even its leaf does not wither. We are used to seeing our trees around here in North Carolina. Their leaves wither even as the tree continues to live. And even we have our evergreen trees, but we are very familiar with all the pine needles that fall down, but not the tree described in Scripture. It has a life that goes on and on and on. Brothers and sisters, which plant describes you? Which analogy is most appropriate for you? Are you chaff or are you a tree? Which is the best analogy for your faith? And your spiritual life, is it chaff or is it a tree? Ask yourself these questions as I ask them to myself. Are you fragile or are you rooted? As we just talked about, both of these plants, the tree and the chaff, the same wind, the same hard conditions blew upon them, but each plant handled it differently. You may be in this world experiencing difficulties that other people around you are also experiencing. But what describes you? How do you handle those difficulties? Are you blown away and destroyed and fall apart by them? Or are you sturdy and do you remain and are steadfast even through these difficulties? What about your faith? Is it easily undone in difficult circumstances? Or does it remain? Is it sturdy? Does it continue? Ask yourself this question as well. Not only are you fragile or are you rooted, are you fruitless or fruitful? Jesus in John chapter 15 and Paul in Galatians 5 and several other passages of Scripture speak of fruit and fruit what it is. It works. It is evidence of life within you. If you are alive, you do works, you give evidence, you give fruit that shows the life that is within you, and then that fruit also is used to bring glory to God and bring life to others. Are you fruitful or are you fruitless? Do your actions, do your faith, does your faith give evidence of life at all times and all seasons? Are you glorifying and rejoicing God in all circumstances? We read and looked at Philippians chapter 4 last week. Are you helping and bringing life to others? Are you simply praying upon them because you have no life yourself? Are you fruitful or fruitless? Is your faith fruitful or fruitless? And then finally, ask yourself this question, are you fleeting or long-lasting? Is your faith fleeting or long-lasting? As we look to Scripture, we are reminded that all life, all physical life is here but for a moment and then gone the next. We are described in Scripture as grass, as flowers that are here and have their beauty and strength one moment and then the next day you look and they are gone. But Scripture not only speaks of physical life, and Psalm 1 not only speaks of physical life, there is also another life that goes on and on beyond our life in this world. It is an eternal life. And which type of plant we are determines which life we will experience after we leave this world. We're told right here in Psalm 1, verses 5 and 6, a reminder of this. God will take the trees. He will take the wise. He will take the righteous. He will take the blessed and bring them into his kingdom and gather them together to live a blessed life and existence forevermore. But those who are the chaff, the fool, the wicked, and the curse will actually be sent away to experience eternal punishment. They will not be gathered by God. They will be separated and cast out. What describes you today? Do you know if you will be gathered by God or cast out? 
Thankfully, Psalm 1 also gives us an indication of the answer that determines whether we are tree or whether we are a chaff. And we read that in the very first two verses of Psalm 1. What determines whether we are chaff or whether we are a tree? According to Psalm 1 and according to the rest of Scripture, it's actually our diet and what we are feeding upon and what we are craving after. Now, obviously, you can tell probably even online that I'm not a marathon runner. It's pretty obvious. But I do know several people that love to run marathons. I'm not sure why. But I know one thing that is absolutely vital to them and important to them is their diet. Those that choose to run these marathons realize that what they put into their body, both on race day and the days and weeks before it, will have a vital impact about how well they run, how long they can run, and how they will finish the race. Their physical diet is absolutely vital to this. But our spiritual diet is even more vital to our life because it doesn't just impact us for a day in one race. It impacts us for all of eternity. And Psalm 1 challenges us to ask ourselves, what does our spiritual diet consist of? Because it determines which plant we are, which determines our life forevermore, and what our eternity will look like. What do the chaff, what do the foolish, what do the wicked, what do the cursed run after and feed upon? They feed upon worldly counsel and advice. They turn to other humans around them. They ask themselves, what is wise in my own eyes? What would I like to do? What would I like to choose? And they listen and follow the counsel and advice of humans of the wicked, of sinners, and scoffers, as we read in verse 1. This is a poor diet. Now, many other people wiser than me have pointed out time and time again the distinction and the lack of momentum that we see happening through Psalm 1. We see the person go from walking to standing to sitting. And I completely agree that that is the goal of the wicked, that is the goal of the devil and all those that follow him is to completely end our walking with God and any momentum we may have. That is true, but I also want to take a moment to point out that taking and listening to and following this advice is bad for our spiritual diet no matter how we receive it. Just like that double chocolate Fudge brownie Sunday is just as bad for our physical diet, whether we get it from a drive-thru, from a counter service, or a sit-down restaurant. The advice and counsel of the wicked is bad for our spiritual diet, no matter if we're walking with them, standing with them, or sitting with them. Now, Don't get me wrong here, we are told to talk to other people. We're even told to talk to the worthy and have conversations and build relations with them. And we can actually learn a lot from them and receive advice. But what we need to remember is if ever they counsel us and advise us or tempt us to go away from God and disobey Him, that is where the direction and guidance and influence needs to end. We must always choose to follow God and to follow his instructions, and to follow his advice. Adam and Eve would have been a lot better off if they had chased the serpent away when he began to tempt them to eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And we will be a lot better if we choose not to indulge in the temptations and leadings of anyone who would also want us to disobey God and what he has told us to do as well. The chaff, however, feed and seek after worldly counsel and advice. Not so with the trees, not so with the wise, not so with the righteous and the blessed. What do they feed upon? Instead, we read in verse 2 that they feed upon God's word. We're told that their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on the law of God he meditates day and night. God's word is always before the tree. It is what they seek after. It is what they crave and hunger for. They feed upon it. They read it 
for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and even their midnight snack. It is what nourishes and feeds their soul. It is what guides their way because unlike human wisdom that comes from man and woman, Scripture contains divine heavenly wisdom that comes to us from God. We read in 2 Timothy 3.16 that it is God-breathed. And so the tree feeds upon directly what the Lord gives him. And unlike the wisdom of man that may fail us and come to ruin, if we follow God's word, if we follow God's advice, it will not fail us. It will continue to lead and guide us into prosperity and to blessing. That might not look like material prosperity and blessing, but it will be spiritual prosperity and blessing. It will be eternal prosperity and blessing. Proverbs 4 verses 20 through 22 tells us, My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's body. Because the wise, the righteous, and the blessed feed upon God's word, they are described as a tree by a river. What's the difference between a tree by a river and a regular old tree? Well, that regular old tree, it can easily come undone if there is a drought, if there is harsh weather, if there is a famine, if there is A storm, it's completely dependent upon the season and what's happening around them. But not so with the tree planted by a stream of water. It has the nourishments. It has the source of life. It needs in all circumstances, in all seasons, because it has what it needs to grow and to be healthy and produce fruit. Such is the truth for the tree for the one who is feeding upon God's word. They have what they need in season and out of season to be healthy and strong and produce fruit. Brothers and sisters, what are you feeding upon? What are you craving after, especially spiritually? Are you listening to and following the example of the world? Are you listening to and following the instructions of God, which he gives us in his word? I think a great example of this is what's happening right now in our society. If you're anything like me, time and time again, you find yourself in front of the television. You find yourself in front of the web browser. What is the world telling me to do? What are the scientists, what are the governments telling me to do? And I think that is a good and a wise thing to get advice about protection and keeping ourselves safe. But just as you're craving after that word, do not neglect to crave after and seek after God's word because it will give us wisdom and advice not just to see us through this season, but to see us through all of our life and through all of eternity. It contains God's words, God's instructions, God's life, and it can secure us both now and for always and keep the hope and peace and life within us if we feed upon it. Which one describes your diet? Which one describes which plant you are, chaff or a tree? Then finally, I would end on this, is that I love Psalm 1, not but just because of the wisdom that it gives us about God's word and having it in our life, God's written word, but it's actually easy to look at Psalm 1 and find Jesus within it as well. Where's Jesus in Psalm 1? You might say, I don't see that in any way. But do you remember what Jesus is described as in John chapter 1? We've been talking in Psalm 1 about someone who is seeking after and feeding upon the law of God, the word of God. Well, John chapter 1 describes Jesus Christ as the word of God incarnate. John chapter 1 verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes, we need God's written word, but we also need God's incarnate word for life. Try as we might, 
We will never be able to fulfill all the requirements of God's law and instructions. We will fail, and we will not be counted in of ourselves among the righteous. But God in his mercy, out of love while we were still sinners, sent his son Jesus Christ, his incarnate word, to come to earth, to live a perfect life, and then to give that life for our sins and failures upon the cross so that we might be made righteous in his sight, so that we might have life and life in abundance. And how do we receive that? By turning to, by seeking after, by trusting and having faith in Jesus, God's incarnate word. If we have Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are made like a tree, not just now, but for all of eternity. If we have Jesus, we'll be like a tree in that we will be rooted. We will not become undone, for Jesus Christ has conquered all of our enemies. If we have Jesus Christ united to him, we will be fruitful because Jesus' spirit is as alive and at work in us, enabling us to live for God and to bear fruit, not just for ourselves, but for the benefit of those around us. If we have Jesus Christ in us, we are like a tree because we will be long-lasting. Not even death itself can end us. Because Jesus Christ has defeated death for us. We will be like a tree with leaves that never wither. Brothers and sisters, which type of plant are you? Are you a tree or are you chaff? Are you feeding upon God's written word? Are you feeding and trusting after Jesus Christ, God's incarnate word? If you are a tree looking to and trusting in God's word, then act like it. Remember that you have security, not just in the world to come and in this life, but for all of eternity. So don't panic. Bear fruit for all the world to see. But brothers and sisters, if you are chaff right now, know that you don't have to stay that way. Stop feeding upon the world and everything that it says. Trust in Jesus Christ. Trust in God's word. And know that just as Jesus' word brought life from nothing, just as Jesus' word brought life and God's word brought life from dirt to create man and then woman, and just as God's word brought life to dry bones in Ezekiel chapter 37, God can bring life to you through Jesus Christ, his word this very day. Will you turn to him and trust in him and receive the life he can bring? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that we once again can turn to you and to your word. Guide us, Lord, lead us. Help us, Father, to change our diets. Help us, Lord, to change what kind of plant that we are. And help us, Lord, if we are a tree, to truly display it. Help us, Lord, to remember that we in Jesus Christ are rooted, we are fruitful, and we are long-lasting because of what he has done for us. It's in his great name we pray. Amen.
my heart, oh. 